And we are live here on the Max Van Auken podcast. I am joined by Bethune Cookman University head basketball coach Ryan. River. Thank you so much for giving me. How are you doing today? I'm doing great, Max. Thanks so much for having me, man. Look, looking forward to hanging out with you a little bit. Yeah, I know. I was so excited for this one. So first off, how's the deck coming along? I know you said you're working on that. <laughs> you know, we're, uh, we're we're fitting it in when we can. Um, you know, I, I, I don't know if I'm a good basketball coach, but I think I might be a little better at that than building decks. So we'll we'll see how it comes out. <laughs> I've realized a lot of people during the, the pandemic pick up on some things that they're trying to get into or learn a little bit. I know myself. I'm really trying to make an effort in reading more. And so during the pandemic, I was actually reading a little bit more. So maybe this is your um, your calling to build and focus on construction. Yeah, um, you know, uh, I got to give credit to my assistant. He, he's helped me with quite a few projects around the house. So he's kind of teaching me some different things. And, and uh, it's enjoyable, but I uh, definitely don't know if it's my next calling. <laughs> right. Well, let's focus on you as a head coach then. Um, obviously, your father... Um, Coach Ritter as well from Embry-Riddle. I went to his camp when I was young, and I learned so much from him, so much. Um, and then I don't know if you remember this. So attending Daytona State, this was before I really got into my podcast and covering the magic and interviewing these players. And um, really to the point where now, I'm just interested in the game of basketball in any shape or form. And I remember going to one of your practices and helping out a little bit. And I was so impressed with you, um, with your team, and really like just the live drills that you made them do. Going to Rob, who actually attends Bethune Cookman, um, he's like my brother from another mother, Robert McKenzie. He plays football there, um, and I remember going to him and I'm like, I have never seen a practice like this. And I mean, I've played under Coach Howard and Coach Giddens, and I was, and he's like, What do you mean? And I'm like, I don't know. It was just something. The, the drills that you made your players do reminded me so much of what you see in a game. It was just like real. It was just different. I'm not trying to give your secret formulas here, but so to have you on here, and this is why I love doing podcasts. So I get to speak to so many different interesting people and learn so many things that really left an, a mark on me and just learning from you. So I want to start off by saying thank you, because I really did learn a lot from that practice. Well, I, I appreciate the kind words. I appreciate you coming. Um, and it's just, there's so many good coaches at all different levels of college basketball. And sometimes I think, you know, people get labeled in different regions or different areas or different levels. And, um, you know, some of my best friends are junior college head coaches and, and, and they're some of the best coaches in the country. So I appreciate you saying that and, um, you know, just trying to trying to work and, and get better day by day. Right. And you're certainly one of the best coaches around. Um, and I see such an amazing future for you as a head coach. But before we get into what you've accomplished and what you're trying to do, um, I want to give the people listening kind of an idea on how you got started. So what really got you into it? Obviously, you used to play yourself. How did you know you wanted to become the head coach that you are today? Well, I think it started, you know, obviously you mentioned it before. My, my dad, um, you know, he's been coaching for, shoot, I guess almost 40 years now when you add up his his time in Bria, Kentucky and now at Embry-Riddle. So, um, you know, growing up in a basketball household, um, we all played, you know, my brothers, my sister, we all played growing up and um, you know, it just, it was a way of life, you know, it'd be a Tuesday night and you're getting home at midnight because you drove down to Miami to watch your dad's team play. And, and I never thought it was anything different. I just thought that's what, you know, Hey, we, we didn't get a chance to eat uh, dinner as a family. We were out on the road, we did this. And, and, um, so I think, you know, we were kind of born into it, but as we got, you know, as I got into college and, and was fortunate enough to play up at college of Worcester in Ohio, and then come back and play for my dad, um, it became very apparent that I wasn't going to play in the NBA. Um, so I probably needed to focus on on what I want to do next. I knew I wanted to impact people and, um, you know, using basketball as a vehicle to do that. It, it kind of just opened the door and I had a chance to learn from some great coaches. And and really, that's the foundation of, of how I knew I wanted to get into coaching. Now, when you started coaching, um, we'll get into like what you're doing here at Bethune Cookman. But when you first originally started coaching, every coach has a style, like every coach has an identity. Um, did you know right away what kind of coach you would become? Is it like, Hey, I'm going to take a little bit of what I learned from my father, obviously, maybe a little bit from here and form my own. Did you kind of, he has done, did you know right away how you were going to approach being a coach? Well, I, I think that that's such a good question because there, there's such a broad, uh, variety of answers that, that, that could potentially work here. And, um, you know, I think what, what was really important to me, what I learned from my dad and even even coach more up at, at College of Worcester is it's all about the student athlete experience. And it's it's creating, a, you know, an unbelievable opportunity 
um, to, to impact them and for them to be successful through the game of basketball. So, you know, the X's and the O's and, and that part is fun. I love it. You know, I, I think I'm continuing to grow with that. Um, but in terms of treating people the right way and running your program with, with discipline and integrity um, and, and passion, and uh, that's really what I took from them. And I knew that no matter, you know, what sport, no matter what profession, no matter what, that's what I wanted to do is, is build a foundation through, through those. And, and then the X's and O's, man, I, I think those, those are, those are ever changing. You, you look at the NBA right now, you look at college, right. I mean, that, that stuff changes year by year. But I think the way that you treat people um, and the way that you build an organization um, that hasn't changed. So, um, you know, the, the foundations of, of those principles are really important. Right. And now I noticed that when it granted it was just a handful of practices that I got to see. But when you were at Daytona State, I got to see that. And it's you weren't just a coach saying, hey, do this and then walk away and kind of just observe a little bit. You were hands on. You were right there. I even saw you play a little bit of defense. I'm like, OK, coach, you look like you definitely had some game on you. So I'm like, you could see the passion that you coach with. And I think the players really gravitate towards that because then it's like oh wow like if you're really caring this much to be a part of the drill and to get into it i think that's very um rashad phillips who like my mentor he always refers to it as magnetism i think a lot of players are drawn to that and gravitate towards that have you noticed that when because of your coaching style players are more drawn to really listen to you well i I think you just hit it right on the head to me that's the most important thing um it's building genuine real relationships with your with your players and, um, you know, this this game of basketball is going to end at some point, whether it's uh, next year, five years, 20 years. Uh, but it's all the ball is going to stop bouncing at, at some point for everybody. And so, you know, when you can take it off the court and really develop those genuine relationships, I, I think absolutely. Because when you're asking guys to, to do certain things on the court, um, there's no hesitation. You know, they, they trust in you. They trust that you have their best interests. And, um, you know, for me, I, I wasn't the best player. I was a pretty good college player, but didn't play at the highest level. And, you know, so I can't draw back and say, hey, look at my film when I did this. That film doesn't exist. Um, <laughs> right, so, right, right. You know, I've got to I've got to build it through hands on approach of of really getting to know each guy individually and how to coach them best. Right. So now let's um, talk about your transition. So you went from Daytona State, had an incredible run there. Um, it's extremely successful. Um, and then you transitioned to Bethune Cookman. So how important was fit when making that decision? How did you know Bethune Cookman was the right choice for you? You know, um, the, the the coaching profession is so crazy. You know, one day you're you're on a roller coaster going up, then coming down, and right. And um, you, you know, at that point, um, we we were really fortunate at Daytona State. We we had won four conference championships in a row, and um, I, I loved being there. I had great people around me. My boss, Will Dunn, was awesome. Um, but I definitely was was you know interested in getting back to the Division One level. Thought it might be as an assistant again. Um, was interested in some Division Two jobs, uh, head jobs at that point. And um, really, I, there was about two or three jobs that that all kind of spearheaded on one week. And um, I really believed in Lynn Thompson, who's the AD at Bethune Cookman. I really believed in his vision for our program, and it was so much more kind of what we just talked about. So much more than just basketball. And um, you know, I think the fit to be in my own backyard at a, a HBCU um, to represent our community, there's just not a lot of better fits uh, for me personally. And and I think, um, you know, we've been here three and a half years now and, and absolutely thrilled with the choice. Love that they have me here. And, and um, man, it's it's humbling to wake up and be a Division One head coach every day. Right. Now, yeah, that's incredible. I, I couldn't imagine I don't think I'll ever actually imagine what that feels like. Um, as So, okay, as a college coach, not even just as a college coach, but as a coach, I can speak just from the relationships I still have with all my coaches growing up. Like, I still am constant communication with them, Coach Brink, Tremont, um, Howard, and I, and I speak to them daily. And I just, I've always learned so much from them. And they play such a huge role in my life to who I've become now, um, who I still am trying to become. I constantly call them for advice and really learn from them every day. Um, so as a coach, you play such a huge role in these players' life, not even just development on the court, but as men off the court. Um, for you, like, does that go hand in hand? So you building that relationship, how important is that to have that type of relationship with your players? Well, you, you just named me, man. You, you've been fortunate. You play for some great coaches, and, and those are still your mentors today, and you haven't you know, played for them in, in, in years. And yeah. um, I think that's, that's – you asked the question earlier. That's why I got into coaching. You know, obviously my dad's a coach, but some of the most impactful people in my life have been coaches. Um, so I, I think, 
you know, more than anything at this point, especially with where we're at um, in society right now, we, we've got a chance to really impact some young people that can make a change in our society, which we desperately need. And um, so, you know, I, I think that, that the player coach relationship, um, that's the foundation of, of building great programs. Right. Um, specifically here in Daytona beach, for those listening, um, this whole podcast is, I'm in, I'm from Daytona beach, coach Ritter, Bethune Cookman here at Daytona beach. Um, you play such a key role in the town. I always think of coach Carter when I think of this, because when I watch the movie coach Carter, like the whole town is just gravitated towards that team. But Bethune Cookman has such a huge support system in the community. Um, everywhere you go, people are talking about Cookman. They're involved with Cookman. Um, so playing such a key role in the player's life, um, in the school's um, success, also as the community, as a town, that's a, that's a lot of pressure on you, and that's also a lot of expectations. So for you personally, um, what are your expectations as a head coach and, and for Cookman? Because you have so many people looking at you, so many people supporting you guys as well. Um, what What are some of your personal goals with all those people watching you? Well, you know, I think the the first thing is, is I said it a little bit earlier, just so humble to be the head coach here, uh, just for what our institution represents and, and uh, you know, rich tradition of, of everything that, that um, you know, our school uh, represents, not just community, but uh, nationwide. Um, so, you know, I think the goal for, for we always talk about our players is we got to go one and oh every day. And, you know, nobody really cares what you did yesterday. You start looking into the future and, and, and then you get off track. So our, our, our thing as a team is go one and oh every single day and you know obviously with with COVID happening and, and our season getting a little off track we, we've had to reshift our gears you know what does one and oh look like um for our players what does one and oh look like for me today personally and um you know you know so the first thing is just being extremely humbled uh to be the head coach here but but the second part is making sure that I'm representing this institution um at the highest level and we do have great support here um, we, we do have a lot of eyes watching, which I don't take for granted. So um, one, it's 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 not a dirty thing to say. I want to put a winning product out there. We want to be a really good basketball team. That's OK to say, hey, I'm, I'm competitive as heck. I want to win. <laughs> yeah. Uh, you know, we want to win, but we also want to do it the right way. You know, we want to have our guys that are representing the community and, and giving back, um, giving them the, the opportunity to, to really understand what it means to give back to somebody. And then lastly is is making sure that our guys are performing at the highest level they can academically. And it's different for each guy. You know, some guy that, that maybe is point oh and graduating in three and a half years with a, a you know a physical science degree, then he needs to do that. But another guy that maybe is a, a first time generation college student that, that is is a two point five student but gonna find a way to graduate, well then we need to find a way to maximize his ability. So um, right. that's kind of the expectation we have as a staff. That's awesome. That's fantastic. Um, now, before we get into the year of COVID-19 and just your program specifically, I wanted to ask you this. So I covered the draft on SUV TV. I had the opportunity with Rashad Phillips and Kate and Zach, and it was in Atlanta. It, I had an amazing time. So I actually had to go through all 60 prospects. And so I had to watch film. I had it. And I loved it. I'm like a kid in the candy shop. I just love the game of basketball. Um, and so I'm watching Mason Jones from Arkansas, the junior. I'm watching Grant Riller, the senior from Charleston. And I'm like, man, these are the guys that don't get talked about because they're not the sexy one and done player. But they are these are amazing basketball players and they're so refined. And I've always said there's no summer league. And so I think a lot of these upperclassmen are going to do really well, really early in the NBA. But my point is, I had so much fun breaking down talent and looking at things. And at the end of the day, we all don't know until we see it play out. Uh, but for you, when you're evaluating talent, when you're looking at talent, for example, um, you guys have Kendall Bean now. And I, I remember watching him growing up and playing at the rec all the time. Uh, so when you look at players, what are some of the what are like the three traits that you look for in young players as a coach? They're like, OK, he can play for me. Well, I, I think the, the first one, to be honest, that everyone's afraid to say is it's physical. gifts. I mean, you have to be a really good basketball player to play at the Division one level. So as much as. Um, you know, the, the, um, in, you know, internal aspects are important attitude, work ethic, all that, that's, that's, that takes you over the top. But I, I think the first thing is, you know, there's 357 division one teams in the country, you know, so if you've got, you know, 11, 12, 13 guys on a roster, there's really only about 4,000 spots that are open for division Ooh. one men's basketball players. So the first thing I got to say, I mean, you have to be at an unbelievable, um, you know, level of skill set. 
to, to even have the opportunity. So that's the first thing. You know, you, you're going to have to be one of the best players, uh, not only on your team, but in the area and in the state. Yeah. Uh, and then the, the, the second part is, you know, the game is shifting. You, you know, I think we're really putting more of an emphasis on shooting, spacing the floor. Um, whereas traditionally, the teams that I've coached have been ultra athletic, play above the rim, rebound, toughness, length. Um, and I still we still love that. But the way the game is trending is, is you know, we really need to find some guys that can space the floor and shoot the ball um, at all five positions, really. Yeah. And so that's the biggest thing that, that from the eye thing that has changed for me is is we just put more of a which sounds crazy because the game of basketball is played where the more shots you make, the, the, the greater chance is to win. Right. So that always be a priority. But um, here this last little bit, that's kind of been the biggest priority. And then. You know, obviously the things that, that people talk about are real. You know, you want to talk to the coaches. Is this dude a hard worker? Is he trustworthy? Does he get good grades? Um, can you count on him? Is he is he high trust, low maintenance? Those are important things for our program. Right. It's building a culture, and you certainly have built a culture everywhere you've gone. Um, okay, so let's talk actually about the game of basketball and the trend that it went in. So obviously more three-point shooting, um, spacing, a little faster tempo, when did you start to really notice that shift as far as the younger generation that you're evaluating? Like, at, like you said, at some point it wasn't always like that. So when did you start to notice that? And then now everyone growing up is shooting threes right away. It's like, I remember going to certain practices, people don't even warm up with the layups and the mid range anymore. People are just jacking up threes as soon as they step in the gym. How was that transition like as a coach? Like, was it like, Oh wow. Every, everywhere I look, that's all they're doing. You know, it's funny that you say that because I don't really know if the transition happened overnight or if it just has yeah. kind of been gradual. But um, I've always been a defense rebounding toughness guy. So if you were a 6'5", six, 6'6", six, six, kind of no position athlete, we thought we had a pretty good chance to help you become a good basketball player because that's just how we played. We, we, we ran. We were tough. We, um, Well, I started, I don't know if it was the last three or four years, we started finding ourselves recruiting guys that shot the ball. And so we started – I don't know if it's the, the blooming of analytics. You know, I don't know exactly when that trend started um, happening, but I, I would say in the last three to five years, it has been an absolute, you're right, you go to an AAU event, you go to a, a prep school event, and the amount of, uh, you know, perimeter jump shots being taken are, are uh, you know, they're just astronomical. Yeah, it, it's it's crazy. Now, I think there's some things that you have to see with the eye test, though. Not everything shows up on a stat sheet. So as a coach, obviously, I'm sure you have tons of people going through the stats. How much do you like weigh in the stats? Like I know we've seen an instance in baseball this year where, according to the analytics, you're not going to put in this because mm -hmm. according to the data, that's not the smart decision. But sometimes it's the eye test. Play the pitcher. Um, how much do you weigh each category okay the eye test and the stats yeah that's such a good question and there's going to be a lot of people that disagree with me on this um but that's one of the hardest things is is you have to have um you know your foundations your non-negotiables right but then you okay. also have to adapt and be flexible with the game and so one of the hardest things is um i i i absolutely believe in analytics okay i absolutely believe that they have a a very strong spot in our game but I am probably still a little slower moving towards that because there's something for me that it, there, there's feel, there's eye test, there's grit, there's toughness, there's there's stuff internally. I think sometimes that uh, you know doesn't show up on on those analytical stat sheets. So uh, we definitely value them. We we stat all of our practices. You know we 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 put stock into it. Um, but you know at the end of the day we we still you know feel like just the the, the you know, not in this day and age, but the touching of our players and, and being able to put our hands on them and understand, you know, how big, strong, physical they are, what right. how we might play is, is still super, super important. Right. A um, couple last things here, Coach. I really appreciate, appreciate your time as always. Um, you talked about kind of the flexibility and adapting in the feel of a game. Well, this has been the year of, of adapting. 2020 has just been unpredictable for everybody. Um, so for you, what are some of the things for you and your program? Like, obviously, we have what's going on with the pandemic, and so that affected the season. So you don't really get 100% of the feel of what your team is looking like because you are, you're not able to compete this season. So from you, what have you been able to take away from your team thus far, and what are some things that – I'm a glass half full type of guy, so how has this benefited you and your program and your team because you have this extra time now? You know, that I'll tell you what, Max. Um, it's it's you know 
it's been tough on everybody. The, 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 the scheduling challenges and, and the unknown of, of who's going to be available and, you know, the preparation. Um, the thing that's been challenging for us is, is we are in year four here at Bethune-Cookman. And, you know, I think we've steadily been building our program. And if you look at it, yes, we won the league in year one, the regular season. And we, you know, we finished in the, in the top four the next two years. So we, we've really cemented ourselves, I think, in that top one, two, three or four programs in, in the MEAC. And, and obviously we'll transition to the SWAC. But um, for me, it was it was the first recruiting class that we were able to spend, um, you know, a lot of time prior to them signing with them. So it was the first time that all every guy on our roster was fully recruited by us. Um, and we felt really good. You know, we had nine of our of our 13 guys from the state of Florida. We had, we had worked really hard to build relationships from state. And so on paper, maybe we didn't have as, as attractive of a recruiting class as maybe we we had in years past. Right. But I would be shocked if this hadn't been our best team um, because of the makeup internally of the 13 guys we had on the roster. So that's been the frustrating part because we obviously feel that way. Um, right. And there's. Why wouldn't we feel that way? There's no if we lose that, you know, we're not playing any games. So um, we felt great about that. That's been tough. But, um, you know, we're, we're adapting as well, as well as we can. Technical difficulties, but we are back. Um, so I was saying with the year of adapting 2020, um, everyone is just kind of figuring it out as we go along. Uh, but for you, since there hasn't been real gameplay to, for you to look at, what have you taken away from the team that you've had thus far? And also, how has it benefited you, your players and your program kind of having this timing as a glass half full type of guy? How has this benefited you during the pandemic? Yeah, I, I think the, uh, you know, the first uh, response to your question is, um, you know, going into year four, this is, you know, we, we felt like we've had some some really good success on the floor um, in terms of, you know, we were very fortunate to win a conference championship our first year and, and finish in the top four the next two years. So, um, you know, we feel like as a team, we, we're starting to sum ourselves in that, you know, top one, two, three or four of the MEAC. And, and as we'll transition to the SWAC next year, felt really good about some of that momentum. Um, but we talked about building a program and not just building a team. And so right. we've had some some team success basketball wise, but the the I guess frustrating or upsetting part was this is our fourth year and this was the first recruiting class um, that was done completely by our staff, and we felt like we had put in a lot of time and effort into relationships and and really got the the, the guys that we wanted, whether they were high school guys, whether they were a couple junior college guys, whether they were you know four year transfers, and you know on paper. Maybe our recruiting class wasn't as as strong as as it had appeared in years past. But um, Max, to be honest with you, I think this was the best team we've ever had. Uh, it's the best team we've ever assembled. And so that's been the frustrating part. The second part to your question is how do we use that and how do we benefit from it? Well, I, I think it's it's continuing to um, you know show these guys to trust the process. If if they are who we think they are and they're they're really good basketball players, they're great people and they're tough. Um, then they'll continue to use this next, really, it's going to be a next 9, 10, 11 months to prepare uh, for next November. And, and that's that's yeah. got to be our mindset because right now we, we don't get a chance to play games, but that can't stop our work. And we'll do it safely. We'll, we'll do it um, however we're allowed to. But I've been nothing but impressed with the 13 guys on our roster, um, how they've handled this, you know, disappointment, um, adversity, and, and how they responded to it has been phenomenal for young people. Wow. I see a coach like yourself. I would expect that type of answer. You found a way to improve upon it. I think a lot of people during this pandemic, um, 
it really affected them and some not at, not as many people are as good at adapting and i think you guys have used this in not to not to downplay the situation the severity of covid-19 but you guys have been able to use this as an advantage to your point really benefit your program so coach this is the, the this is the, the the last and main point i want to touch on here before um, I ask you what your expectations are for um, the upcoming season, assuming everything clears up. Um, OK, here we go. So my, my question for you is this. So I feel HBCUs in general as a whole um, deserve more love and attention from the media and, and from people. And I think we're starting to see the top recruits starting to go that HBCU route. Um, so going forward, do you believe that is a trend or a more attractive route for up? coming talent and for more of the media to cover now? Well, I, I think the first thing is, um, you know, a lot of people don't understand that HBCUs are, are they're not exclusively black, black. They're historically black. You know, they're, they were for, for um, you know, minorities that, quite honestly, because of segregation, were not allowed into higher education institutions. And so right. this gave them an opportunity to continue to learn. And so I think that the biggest thing is shedding light on on the diversity at HBCU, sh shedding light on the tradition. Um, there's so many great people that have come from HBCUs, so many people that have gotten their start at HBCUs. And, um, you know, for the past, um, you know, I don't know how the exact years, but for the past years, um, we have struggled with some resources at HBCUs. So I think what you're seeing now is now that there's attention being shown and there's, there's um, you know, athletes that are are making important life decisions and choosing HBCUs. Now you're starting to see the the, the media and, and, and the you know the general public realize, wow, these these schools are very important. Wow, they have a lot to offer. And I think as you start to see more resources pull pour in, um, you're going to see the expansion of in of of all HBCUs. And I don't know if it's just purely athletics, um, but I think they just serve such a great purpose um, that, that we've got to continue to pour resources into them. Right. Uh, so lastly, coach, I really appreciate your time and uh, dealing with the technical difficulties, patients. I always appreciate that. Um, going, let's just, let's just assume everything clears up next season. I know you kind of already touched on your program and your thoughts of the program right now and the current team that you have. What are your expectations? So people listening to this from Daytona beach or from out of town, they hear Bethune Cookman basketball. They really like coach Ryan Ritter. Um, what is what are your expectations for next season when that comes about uh, at, for the program? Well, I like your your glass half full because that means we're playing next year and, and yeah. somehow find a found a way to con, you know contain this virus. But um, you know our expectation, I said it earlier, is to go one and zero. It's to maximize our um, it's to maximize our day and, and put our best foot forward. But in terms of basketball wise, I mean, we're going into a new conference, uh, Southwestern Athletic Conference, the SWAC, and, and there's a lot of really good teams in that league. You know, you're just seeing, you know, Texas Southern's already knocked off multiple teams, um, uh, Division One teams this year. And and so our expectation is, is to go in and compete at a high level. Um, our goal is to go in and win that league. It's to win the regular season championship. It's to win the conference tournament championship and, and play for a bit in March. That's our goal. Um, the expectation is, is that we leave no stone unturned and, and we do everything possible to give ourselves that chance. And, and I like our, I love our staff. I love our players. Um, I think we've got the right guys in place. We've got to find a way to keep them um, engaged and keep them committed to Bethune Cookman during this time, even though we're not playing, um, add a couple more pieces here in the off season. And, and I think we'll be fired up for, for next no, November, like, like we've never been before. Coach Ritter, this was an absolute honor for me. Um, I've been a fan of yours. Like I said, ever since that practice that they took a mark on my life. So it's been an absolute honor to have you on my podcast. You're welcome anytime. Um, but Dune Cookman, head basketball coach, Coach Ritter. Um, is there anywhere people can maybe check out your program? Is there a website and maybe more information on yourself? Uh, the floor is yours. Yeah, so, um, you know, our, our, our Twitter page is probably the best for up-to-date information. Uh, BCU men's basketball and, and I, uh, forgive me I have to check the Twitter handle I don't want to give you the wrong Twitter yeah. handle but if you type in <laughs> People, Bethune Cookman men's yeah. basketball comes up um, obviously our bcuathletics.com uh, for all our sports would be uh, a great a great place to start um, and then also you know obviously my, my Twitter is probably uh, the, the third best area to get information regarding Bethune Cookman men's basketball so uh, Max I appreciate you having me on man I love to do it again sometime
That sounds fantastic. Thank you, coach. Be safe. And uh, we'll talk soon. Thanks a lot.